Welcome back to the 87th episode of Fur, Fins, and Feathers with our returning guests who are going to talk about pigeons. Frank and Guy, welcome back. Talk about who do we have here? So this is probably one of my favorite birds. Uh, her band number, it's IF2015 Rhode Island 1601. I call her Perfect Diamond. She's probably my best breeding bird. Uh, she's, in the last four years, she's bred me 50 top results around the country. M bunch of wins and... Top racing pigeon. Yeah. She, well, she's a breeder, but she's probably the best breeder that I own. And why is she so special? Uh, I think it's just the percentage of her children that, that go on to win races or stay at the top and her grandchildren and her great-grandchildren. It's like everything that stems back from this bird seems to have some sort of good result behind them. Frank, can you explain what people should be looking for in a pigeon? Yeah, with uh, with a racing pigeon. She's beautiful. She is beautiful. She's a super. They have extremely soft, supple feather. Very, very soft feather. And what we find that the good ones, I'm not sure if the soft feather is more aerodynamic or cuts through the air better, which causes greater speed, but the, the good ones always have great feather. They have nice muscle. They're strong. The breast is strong and muscular and beautiful wing, as you can see here. They're very aerodynamic. They're very, they're not front heavy. They're not back heavy. They're, you know, they're very balanced. Now she's known for her breeding capabilities, but is she a racer as well? No, I never raced her. I kept her, back then I was more into showing in 2015. I was maybe 14 years old, 13, 14 years old. So I did more of the showing. So I selected her based on her show qualities. And I showed her all around the country and she was always she was winning every show in sight I've got trophies four feet tall from her and then when I started racing more her children and her grandchildren great-grandchildren they all started popping up and I started noticing a pattern so I started focusing around her more yeah some of the birds have a like a prepotent genetics and they breed good children and their children breed and their grandchildren breed and kind of like even in like race horses just some horses you see for generations and pedigrees they just some are just better than others and we're constantly trying to breed that bird that will be better and bring us to the next generation of pigeons and to keep improving but she's a beautiful beautiful hen and you know and again you can't tell until you race the babies or breed from the babies you don't know you try to select quality she has the highest quality the richly colored eyes and a white wattle which is above the nose and the beak uh, great feather she has all the characteristics to be a champion but until you test them you really don't know you have to you have to breed from them to to tell and some of us have as for many years looking at pigeons you can sort of see like you probably looking at the terriers and the dogs some of them just have something a little more special. And I look at them and I almost can read them. It's and like me going down the line and picking out the best dog. Exactly. And I have years of experience and I, I've grown up with pigeons and I started as a little kid like Guy. And I think if you grew up with them and you just have an eye for it, like a stock sense, and I'm pretty good with, I, I raise chickens and you know I've been involved with dogs and I do all kinds of you know breeding tropical fish. So my wife says, if you own it, you're probably gonna breed it and try to make it better. But yeah, you have a knack for it and you start to see the quality over time. And I've been pretty lucky to be able to you know select and, and breed quality. But again, until you test them, you never know exactly for sure if they're gonna be great. Yeah. Guy, where, 
Are there pigeon shows? You, you mentioned pigeon shows. Yeah, so there aren't as many as there used to be about 10 years ago. Uh, I know at the Rhode Island Pigeon Club, they have a show there in the fall and in the winter. Uh, they have one show for babies born in, we'll say, 2022. So they'll have a show for that in uh, October 2022. And then they'll have an all-age all show in December. So there'll be a couple hundred birds there, all different breeds from all different countries. And there's one in Sturbridge, Massachusetts also. It's a big one. And me, my dad, and my brother, we would travel down to Pennsylvania, uh, Lancaster, Pennsylvania, for a show. And it seemed like it was endless. I mean, there was two, three, four thousand birds there, all being judged. It was a four-day show. We'd stay overnight at the hotel. And it was really awesome growing up around it. So. I pretty much, I gauged my selection just based off the show pen. I just, I wanted the perfect bird in the hand, the way I wanted it to win a show. And I knew she was special just right as when she was a baby, because she started winning everything just in the shows. And I mean, again, I had no idea that she would be as good as she is as a breeder, but you could also have them off the best pigeons in the world and they could be a dud. I mean, you never know until you test them. Well, she's kind of rare where this is a pigeon that won in the show pen and also is her children are winning in the racing arena also. So so she's dual quality. Yeah, yeah, that's that's that is pretty rare. Very few racing pigeons have like show records and racing records. I mean, that's that's a rare a rare pigeon there and but she is a very very nice pigeon and has, you know, great qualities. Now there are bigger shows like I go to Blackpool England every year in January and like 50,000 fanciers come into this little town in Blackpool for a massive show. Do you go often? Yeah almost every year to this show in, in England and it's... Boy I'd like to have his life. Yeah <laughs> I've been again I've been blessed with the pigeons and um, I travel with a friend that we met through pigeons. We've been friends for 30 years, and uh, I've been actually really lucky. He travels so much on Virgin Airways that he sends me a free air ticket every year. So Gee, I, I wish I had friends I get, like that. I get to fly for free, or I wouldn't go every year. So it works out really well for me. But it's, yeah, 50,000 fanciers come into that show all over From Europe. all over the world. Well, almost the world, yeah. Mostly Europe, and um, they have all breeds was racing pigeons but just an arena of all different breeds and then there's vendors i go mainly for the vendors because they set up with every product they have giant pigeon lofts that you know they'll bring in 50 foot long pigeon lofts which you can walk through and see all the newest gadgets and all the supplies and uh it's yeah it's a pretty amazing and then there's auctions all around town because there's so many people congregated a lot of the fanciers will set up auctions at all the hotels so You'll run from pigeon auction to pigeon auction all weekend. It's really what quite is a an pigeon event. auction? Well, um, yeah, they'll actually have you know they'll rent a room in a hotel, and the gentleman will bring in thirty to fifty of his best pigeons or bred from his best pigeons. They'll have the pedigree of the family tree on the bird, and an auctioneer, and two hundred people will be in the room, and they'll be bidding on these birds. And, um, and that can be locally, too. We have pigeon auctions locally, too. Yeah, there's a lot of them. Usually at the Rhode Island Race and Pigeon Club, there'll be a few auctions a year. And they do it out of uh, the, the Braintree Norwood Club, which is in Norwood. But, yeah, people can buy birds. And um, sometimes fanciers will want to, from another part of the country, will want to introduce their birds to a, a different area. So they'll arrange an auction. And we've had, you know, plenty over the years. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Sometimes from Europe. You guys had a very interesting story that you shared uh, off, uh, you know, not on the air. But I want you to talk about that. Yeah, we wanted to uh, tell you how I met Guy. I, I knew of him, but we raced in different clubs. And then, how many years ago was it? I think it was three years ago. It was 2019. I was a senior in high school. And we did this project at Foxborough High School called Senior Project. And basically you could go out and work the last quarter of high school instead of going to class. And I'm not a big school person, so I immediately thought like I, I need to do this program. So I looked at a bunch of different options. I tried to get with the state police, but because of liability issues, I couldn't do it. 
And then I said, well, what if I do it with pigeons? And then I, I reached out to Frank and I said, hey, like I'm looking for an internship. It'll be 25 hours a week, not paid. And I can help you with whatever you need. And at the time he was doing the importing business and he was just starting up with the pigeons. auction site. Yeah. And he said, yeah, he, he took me under his wing. And I mean, we're, it's weird now. Like I never thought I'd be friends with someone who's so much older than me, but I mean, we get along great and both have the same love for pigeons that brought us together. And you are sharing this today. Yeah. yeah. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, so it's been three years and he's actually worked with me now pretty much since then. Like yeah. I, I got out of the importing business just because of it was so labor intensive and dealing with the countries and the documentation, there was always And how issues. do they get the pigeons from Europe to here? Well, what we would do... How would you import them? I would... What I would do, I would... I was... A, I worked with a shipper over in the Netherlands, and he would... I would arrange for all the fanciers that bought pigeons, they would contact me, and then I would send all these addresses and all these ring numbers, the band numbers of everybody's birds to a courier who would run all around Europe and pick up all the pigeons and bring them to a shipper in the Netherlands right outside of Amsterdam. So this 300 birds would be assembled and then they would do the paperwork on that end and they would you know, put them in these aluminum cases, fly them into quarantine on this end, which I would book and arrange all the quarantine on this end and then go when they finish their quarantine process and all their vet checks and inspections I would you know receive the pigeons and then ship them throughout so they the had US. to be flown over yeah they would come and yeah commercially aligns and but it was such a, it was a process I mean when you're dealing with all the documentation and the governments and occasionally there'd be an avian influenza outbreak somewhere which would delay shipments and but uh, yeah, so I did that for about 10 years. That was the main part of my business, um, the importing business. And I have also done the exporting, shipping to other countries. But now it's mainly the auction business, but he's helped me with everything the last three years. And your auctions, you have auctions all over the country? Yeah, well now it's an online, I have an online auction site. Okay. So what we do is, um, People can post their own birds like eBay, and then we're just middlemen where we collect the money, we take a percentage, and then we pay the you know the fancier his percentage, we keep a percentage, and then what's really helped our auction site because of all my contacts in Europe, we bring over all these expensive high-end European pigeons. So then we'll house them at at my house, and then we'll guy does the photography he'll take a video and he'll post to these birds and we sell them we ship them it's kind of we do everything right in house so a fancy will just send us his pigeons and we'll do everything and then we take a commission they get their commission and now that auction site it's it we just finished our third year it's the biggest in the u.s a race and it's a race and pigeon auction site and you're involved as well yeah, no, I mean, it was it was cool during my senior project. I mean, I got to watch the auction site get built and I got to see all like the building blocks and how far we've came in the last three years. It's really been amazing. Yeah, he, he came on at a good time because I was transitioning out of one business and starting another. I wanted to, as I get older, eliminate all the la much of the labor. With the importing business, I mean, I was carrying crates of birds and shipping, and I have a three-story barn, and you're going up and down the stairs with all these pigeons, and I used to pick them up in New York when they got out of quarantine, so you drive, you know, four or 500 miles in a day, and then you're unloading birds, and it was very labor-intensive. So now with the auction business, we're trying to go more internet-based and less physical <laughs> guy I'm fascinated to know about your bird photography talk about that yeah so I I mean I guess I would call them professional photos in a sense so what I do I have a photo box it's maybe two foot square and I take a picture of the bird's ring on his leg and then I take a picture of the whole bird and I take a couple other clips and I take a picture of the eye and then what I do is I Photoshop them together to make it look like it's like the perfect stature bird because I mean if you put 
a perfect stature bird versus a bird that's slouching or anything else like with the dogs, I mean, you're going to go more towards the one that looks better. So my job is to not really change the birds, but just to, just to Make clean sure them up the a little bit. Make sure they look good. Yeah. yeah, we really, yeah, he, it's like shining your apples for the auction site. I mean, if you have a good picture, it, it makes all the difference in the world. But I also like he does a video because you can't, you know, anybody can Photoshop a picture, but when you actually show the video, he shows the wing, the face, the body, and so people can actually see the pigeon along with a beautiful professional photo. So uh, it's, you know, everybody does professional photos now, but very few people will actually show, you know, the actual video of the bird. We do about 30 second, 30 second yeah, videos 30 second on each videos. pigeon for the auction site. Yeah, and we're totally transparent with it. I mean, me and Frank, we also go through a grading process with the birds, like what we talked about earlier for what we were looking for in, in this hen here. Uh, so there's, it's totally transparent. There's no, we're not hiding anything. We tell you exactly how the bird handles, how it feels, how it looks. And then we give it an overall score of anywhere from eight and a half to nine and a half. Because yeah, there's no probably perfect 10 and we don't want to sell the pigeon unless it has enough quality to be a breeding pigeon. Like we don't, we won't even have it on the auction site if it's not high quality. So we try to keep the standards, you know, very So high. these are the best pigeons. Yeah, and that's funny. It's the auction site is bestpigeons.com. So that's, <laughs> yeah, bestpigeons.com. And uh, yeah, so we have some of the best pigeons in the world on the site and more and more Europeans are getting involved. Plus, there's great birds in America. After the last 40 years of America importing all these superstar birds, America has as good of pigeons as anywhere else in the world. We're, we're pretty lucky here. I'm fascinated by the fact that this is one aspect of life that we don't very few people know anything about yeah it it is it is strange because i'll go out occasionally with you know well if i'm out with my wife i tend not to bring up what i do because either people are extremely interested and it monopolizes the conversation or they just they they can't understand it they just don't want any part of it but it is an interesting field and a lot of people don't know you know what's involved or who's involved but if anybody does want to get involved there's uh there's local clubs which we can name and please we, do yeah we belong to the american racing pigeon union and the american racing pigeon union has a lot of help a beginner program where they offer packets of information how to set up a pigeon loft they offer uh, loaner clocks so people can actually compete with the birds without a big investment but uh, that website is pigeon.org, P-I-G-E-O-N dot O-R-G, pigeon.org. And locally, you can tell about the clubs we have locally. We have a lot of clubs, and they all have junior member programs if someone wants to get their kids involved. I judge junior showmanship for the AKC, and uh, that is an area that is sorely in decline. And we're trying to get, and in fact, I was at a meeting the other night, we're trying to get more younger people involved to keep the dog fancy going. How, what are you people doing? Well, for me, for me personally anyway, I mean, I, all my friends know that I have pigeons. I mean, they, yeah, they think I'm, I'm a little weird, but um, I mean, I, I tell them everything that I do and they find it interesting. I'm eventually hoping that one of them will will spark up enough interest to to start doing pigeons and I also I'm on Facebook uh, my my name on Facebook is landing strip loft and I post a lot and I help a lot of new people and anyone even in the sport that just has questions I I try to help out as much as I can and I know Frank does the same thing it's landing landing strip loft loft Yes. Landing Strip Loft on Facebook. Yes. Yeah, and, and I'm under uh, McLaughlin Lofts, like McLaughlinLofts.com, uh, M-C-L-A-U-G-H-L-I-N, and then it's L-O-F-T-S, McLaughlinLofts.com. If someone wants to contact me and get started, I mean, we 
set people up, we give them baby pigeons, and we want to encourage, you know, even if someone's interested in just keeping homing pigeons, a lot of times that leads into racing in the future. We all started somewhere with a few pigeons or with fancy pigeons, and then, you know, it, it evolves within the sport. And you've traveled all over the world. Yeah, I've been really lucky, and to be able to travel, I speak um, all over the world. I just got back last week. I was at a pigeon convention in Atmore, Alabama. I was their featured speaker, and I did a couple seminars, and uh, you know, I've I've enjoyed it. But yeah, the travel has been great. My family, especially, I have a 22-year-old and a 16-year-old. They're not interested in the pigeons, and. When they got a little older and they started to travel, they saw the pigeons in a different light. They've been to South Africa twice. They've been to Zimbabwe. They've done a lot of traveling with the birds. And now, you know, they like the pigeons, but not to the point where they're not hands-on. But they, they see their dad more as a, a celebrity now in the pigeon sport than what they used to see me as, you know, just someone taking care of pigeons and, you know, in my baseball cap. You know, shipping birds and cared for birds, so they they look at it. In Are these way. daughters? A twenty-two year old daughter and a sixteen year old son, but no real interest in the pigeons. I'm hoping, you know, maybe my son in the future will get involved with the auction site. He loves technology, but in science, but not really the pigeons so much. And you are enamored by the sport. Yeah, no, I mean it's it really it runs through my mind most most of the time during the day. I mean, I pretty much, I wake up at four in the morning and I take the birds out on the road. I go training every morning and I'm scraping the coops every day and I'm on the phone and I pretty much do it until I go to bed. And even when I'm in bed, I still think about like, what can I do with the birds to get a little better? And it always just runs through can my head. Can you talk about their, how you clean them and everything and how their upkeep? So the pigeons, I mean, they, they bathe themselves. And I mean, they naturally preen themselves. You see them like picking up their feathers. They're just cleaning up a little bit. But we give them we give them bath pans, and they'll jump right in the bath pan. And it'll take if they have any bugs, which most of the times they really don't. Um, it'll just clean them up, and it'll take any any poop, dust, anything that's on them. It'll it'll take it right off, and they look like a million bucks after. And with that, with that pigeon lofts, they vary. With some people, just have wooden plain wooden floors and they'll use like a, a scraper and just scrape in just a quick broom, broom them out. Others use shavings or like a wood pellet. You'll see, um, I use the wood pellets that they make for wood stoves, but they sell like a bedding for horses. But I like the wood pellets and I'll put the wood pellets down. It's mainly to keep them dry and then just clean it, clean their perches or clean it occasionally. So um, daily, it's, it's upkeep rather, it's daily. Uh, it doesn't have to be as long as it's dry and they're not crowded. Yeah, it can be weekly. You can go in and touch up the pigeon lofts. Uh, some people are daily. I'm more weekly, and um, but you have to be fed every day. Though. Yeah, fed, watered, everything. That's every day. And it's sort of when you when you're managing a race team, it's sort of like you're the coach because you're training them, you're feeding them. You have to have their body weight right. They're all individuals. This one might be big. This one might be little. So you like managing a team, and some need a little more training than others, and the best handlers, are the, the people with the most success, are the better managers usually. They have good pigeons, and they can manage their team. Like anything else where if you were training horses or, or dogs or working with a, a football team of children, you know, they're all individuals, and people don't realize that, but she has a different personality than every other pigeon in the loft. So you How have do you to train learn. them? What? Well, for training, it all starts when they're babies. I mean, we, we separate them from their parents when they're about 30 days old. And it really starts then, because I mean, they have to, they learn to eat on their own, they learn to drink on their own. I mean, some don't get it right away, and you have to, you have to teach them a little bit more. And then for, for dinner time, for I know Frank does the same, we, we whistle to the birds, and that, it's like Pavlov's dog, where he trained the dog to salivate when it was time to you eat. Have to, you, you have to uh, talk to them? and. I mean, some people, some people do talk to them. I mean, I, I, more, I observe them. I always, I'm always in there watching them and 
and seeing what's observing going on. them. But yeah. but we do train them like to you know whether you ring a bell or shake a grain can or whistle when it's feeding time. So when they're if they're outside, you can call them from it out to in. We train them to come in. Much of what they do is instinct, though. Like I mean, they have a homing instinct and they home to the place of their birth. Like even and a lot of it's not fully understood at this point and so they're starting to figure it out with the magnetic tissue in their brain and the sun compass and but even like salmon being born in a river and then going out to sea for seven years then coming back and spawning in the same river that they were born I mean a lot of that isn't quite understood and a, a lot of this is instinct what they do but we work with instinct with conditioning and feeding correct feeding and making sure their body weight is right and they've had enough exercise and then to compete in the races. Do you weigh them? I don't weigh them. It's more of a, it's more of a feeling. I mean, like you can, I mean, I would rather them, we like them to be light. We like, I guess we call them light and buoyant. I mean, I'd, I'd rather have a pound of feathers over a pound of brick kind of thing. Some people, I mean, I've read articles about I think you could probably weigh them, it would take a lot. Like if a bird's performing well, if you charted its perfect body weight for its best performances, I've never really known anybody to really implement it. A lot of it, like you said, is a feel. You can, you know, they almost feel like an empty water bottle when they're in great condition. They're, they're, they have mass, but there's no weight. Whereas if they have, you know, the water bottle's full, that pigeon is going to work harder to fly than if it's a, a nice, very buoyant, corky type feel. So it becomes a feel for conditioning. And then how they act, you can see um, how they look, how they act. If they're feeling good, they want to fly, they're strutting, they're cooing, they're showing off, their eyes are bright. Uh, they watch you with intensity. If you go in the pigeon lofts, they'll, like, they'll stare you down. And, um, and it's all potty. You can see the conditioning in the birds and the ones, usually you can select the ones that'll be your best performers just by the way they're acting. Now, how far do they travel? So, at least in the United States, our first race is 100 miles. And we'll work them out to 150, to 200, 250, 300, 400, 500, and even to 600 miles is our furthest race. Yeah, so we will race 600 miles, and they'll fly that race in 12 hours, 12 to 14 hours. It's pretty exciting, if you know, for a bird to fly 600 miles, and and it's just, it's pretty. It's better than remarkable. the airlines these yeah. days. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, it's remarkable what they what they do and what they can be conditioned can condition for, and they love to fly. Like we'll let them out, and sometimes they'll just disappear for three and four hours. The flock will leave, and we call it traveling or routing, where they'll just take over and just travel the countryside. And what Guy has done, he is putting a chip on the bird. So when his flock comes home, he can download this chip into the computer and see everywhere his flock has been. Wow. And uh, you've had him go up through Lowell or? Yeah, I mean, I've had them go 75 miles north I've had them actually come down to Swansea and make a big circle up to Bridgewater, back home, and then go back down to where I let them go. I mean, before, I mean, everyone's always wondered where do they go, how do they do it. And this chip pretty much, I mean, if God willing the bird comes home, it, you can see exactly where they went, at what time, the height they went, the speed they were at. I mean, it's really interesting. Yeah, the sport is evolving where we're learning more. Um, eventually. The next phase in the sport, they wear a computer chip for racing, but they're thinking the next phase will be that these chips will be able to watch the race on a computer screen. So it'll be wow. real time and you'll be able to see the competition happening real time. And the technology is there, but it's not small enough at this point for, you know, not to weight the bird down. But as of now, he puts chips on his birds and he can track and see where they've been and it's remarkable how far they've flown which distances height speeds it's very interesting this i'm being told that we are drawing to a close this has been a two this both uh, episodes have been fascinating well thank you we'll so have much to have yeah, you both come back us. again 
this is great and I hope someone, this is stimulating some interest. Well, good. Well, we hope so too. And yeah, if you want to have us back in the future. Oh, well, I would free. love to have you. Well, thank you very much and welcome uh, once again to have you both on the show. And uh, we'll see you the next time on Fur Fins and Feathers. Thank you.